Good evening, everyone. Welcome to what is very much an, uh, sold out, out loud. We're very excited to have you here. Um, I am Jen Nimke, and on behalf of the Office of Community Engagement and my director, Robin Wheeler-Grange, we are so excited to have you here tonight. This is actually the first opportunity our office has had to officially host the Out Loud, which is such an important opportunity to have direct engagement with our stakeholders. Before I begin, I do have a few housekeeping items for both our in-person and our remote audience. So if you are online joining via Vimeo, when you join, your cameras and your mics are automatically off. There can be volume issues, so please make sure to unmute the audio and use the volume bar. If you are in need of closed captioning, there is a button you can select on the lower right-hand side of your screen. It's not always perfect, especially with some of the scientific terms, so please bear with it. And if you are having any trouble at all, please send an email to outloud at anl.gov and we will help you troubleshoot. We are recording the event, so by participating, you are giving consent to be recorded, and we will have the video available on YouTube shortly following the event, which will be pushed out through our e-newsletter. And now, I have the pleasure of introducing our lab director, Dr. Paul Kearns. He's been leading the lab since 2017, and during that time, several critical initiatives have been introduced. In fact, it is his vision to which our Office of Community Engagement was born. We are delighted to have you here to kick us off, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen. It's really uh, wonderful to see so many people here in person. I'm really feeling your energy, so thank you for coming out. I know we've got a large audience that joined us uh, remotely or hybrid as well, and so we're really pleased everyone can be here uh, and participate in this, uh, this evening's discussion. I am Paul Kearns. I have the honor. It's really a privilege to, to be the director of Argonne National Laboratory. Argonne's a fantastic place, a lot of wonderful people. We've got great facilities. We've got uh, really a fantastic evening planned for you, and I think you'll see that firsthand. So it's a real pleasure, really, to be here and to host the program. Uh, the hybrid format does allow us to share our cutting-edge research and pivotal discoveries with a very wide audience. We're very pleased to be able to do that. Since Argonne's beginning in 1946, we have executed science at scale with some of the most powerful facilities and tools in the world. Tonight, we will share with you how we're strengthening, really refreshing, two of our premier research facilities. The Advanced Photon Source, which we commonly call the APS, along with uh, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, which is more commonly known as ALCF, with the Aurora Supercomputer. I think a few of you had the opportunity to put your eyes on Aurora this evening, which is pretty exciting. Since their initial construction in the 1990s and 2000s, these facilities really helped us achieve transformative innovations for society. The massive amount of data collected at the Advanced Photon Source and then analyzed at the ALCF has helped us reach solutions for some of the most complex societies, some of the most challenging problems facing society. We are exploring everything from the farthest depths of the solar system to the inner workings of the brain and renewable energy for a cleaner future. Still, there is no, there's so much more to discover. Uh, to put their capabilities in perspective, the advanced photon source is essentially a powerful microscope using x-rays a billion times, a billion times brighter than those in your dentist office. To peer deep inside materials, it will achieve this magnitude by leveraging beam lines that transport ultra-bright x-rays from the heart of the APS to advanced scientific instrumentation. The Aurora uh, will be able to deliver more than two exaflops uh, of computing power, or more than two billion billion calculations per second. Uh, this machine, which is the size of two baseball uh, courts, has over 10,000 compute blades, or trays of processors, memory, and networks, and cooling technology, and over 60,000 uh, nodes uh, or connection points. Really phenomenal. Our challenge is to get all that working together to really uh, deliver meaningful output, really deep insights. When combined, they will transform how we do science, not only here at Argonne, but really across the nation because they're both national user facilities. Many people come or access those facilities to do their science, and we're really pleased to be able to share these really transformative capabilities with the broader scientific community. Uh, 
when combined, they will transform how we do science, as I said, uh, here at Argonne and across the world. By making uh, APS's X-ray beam some 500 times brighter in Aurora's computing power, more than 100 times faster than what we currently have, they will significantly ac accelerate science and technology uh, for our country and for the world. Aurora's artificial intelligence will quickly sift through large volumes of data uh, from the APS, identify that which merits closer inspection, and enable uh, better focused experiments. Real-time analysis will, will empower uh, on-the-fly decisions, as we call them, to guide scientists as they search for new discoveries, really accelerating the speed of discovery. These machines are like none other in the world. Uh, research that used to take a decade will occur in a matter of months or even a few weeks. With them coming online at Argonne next year, no other national laboratory will host a comparable pioneering pair of technologies. Each will boost the power of the other. They complement each other. They really enhance their capabilities by working together. Tonight's lecture will give you an insider's view of how this dynamic duo will spur revolutionary science. Four of our scientists uh, who will leverage the new advanced photon source and the Aurora uh, supercomputer will describe the upgrades that are underway here for us this evening. Nicholas Ferrara, uh, a computational scientist in the, the computational science division, will discuss how the two facilities will shed light on the formation and evolution of cosmological structure. Nicola uh, Ferrara, uh, a senior computer scientist in, in the math and computing sciences division here at the laboratory, will talk about the mapping of the human brain with new ultra bright x rays and, a machine, and machine learning. And then uh, Sarah Vingehold, uh, physicist in the X-ray Science Division, will inform us on the ways we'll integrate these cutting-edge tools for the advancement of solar energy. Like you, I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to hearing the latest uh, uh, as these uh, scientists speak to their research and their thoughts on what will become the very first research projects uh, of the that are conducted at the upgraded facilities. To moderate tonight's discussion, it is my pleasure to introduce Nicholas Swartz, a principal computer scientist in the X-ray Science Division. In his role, uh, Nicholas uh, leads scientific software and data management at the Advanced Photon Source. He is also responsible for the facility-wide effort to link supercomputing resources with experimental and observational facilities, research facilities here at the laboratory. So please join me in welcoming Nicholas. Nicholas, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And I'd especially like to thank Paul for the introduction. We have a full house tonight with many joining in person and, and just as many or more joining us online today. Um, as Paul so kindly introduced, my name is Nicholas Schwarz. I am a computer scientist here at Argonne National Laboratory, and I will act as your, uh, your moderator for tonight's Argonne Out Loud. I am personally very excited to work with a diverse team of highly intelligent, highly dedicated researchers using the latest in science and technology to build something of this magnitude. What we're doing at Argonne stands to have a significant impact to help make the nation and the world a better place than it is today. In just a moment, I'll turn it over to tonight's speakers, but before I do, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the ways my colleagues and I are working to transform the way that we do science. Now, the full breadth of discoveries that will be possible with this supermerger will emerge and evolve over time as our researchers, our scientists, and our user communities begin to take full advantage of these world-leading capabilities. Some of the impact that we envision are the ability to help us accelerate the development of pharmaceuticals and therapeutics to fight diseases, such as different forms of cancer, and even future pandemics, as Argonne has done during the COVID-19 pandemic. It'll give us a better understanding of the chemistry needed to make faster charging, longer lasting batteries. It will help us enable the characterization required to make faster, smaller, and more energy efficient next generation microelectronics and it will allow us to continue to engineer stronger and lighter materials used in everything from household items to airplane wings. Now, to hear more about the groundbreaking scientific endeavors enabled by this transformation, I have the pleasure to turn this over to uh, the first of our three speakers. So again, I'd like to welcome to the stage Nicholas Frontier. 
He will speak about simulations involving the evolution of the cosmos and how Aurora will help us understand some of the most compelling mysteries of the universe. So, Nicholas, please. Thank you, Nick. Oh, can you all hear me? Yes. It's wonderful to see you all. I'm Nicholas Renteri. I'm a cosmologist here at Argonne. And we're going to be talking about our simulations of the universe that we do here. We're going to begin with what you see in front of you. So these are 12 images of space as seen by a particular kind of telescope. And some of these images might be real data, and some of them might be produced by some of our simulations. And I, take, I invite you to take just a moment to see if you can distinguish which ones are real and which ones are fake. I, I should be able to point too, yeah. What about that guy? Maybe real or fake? Well, turns out they're all fake and they're all from the same simulation. But hopefully, by looking at this, you can see how much detail goes into some of these things. And so we're going to talk about what goes into our simulations, what questions are we asking, and why Aurora is going to be so impactful. So let's start with the questions. So what are cosmologists even interested in? Well, generally speaking, we're interested in the nature of the universe as a whole. What are the components of it? How do those components evolve over time? Now, these questions aren't anything new. I think humans have been asking the origin of the cosmos for thousands of years. But the thing about our universe is every time you think you know what's going on, you look up and all of a sudden it proves to you way more is happening than you really understood. And there's two nice examples of that in modern cosmology. The first is when we realize our universe is expanding outward. And not only is it expanding outward, it's actually accelerating outward. And if you think about that for a minute, that doesn't make any sense because if gravity was dominating everything on large scales, it shouldn't be pushing away in all directions. There must be some driving mechanism behind this expansion. And in fact, we call this driving mechanism dark energy. And a big goal in cosmology is to understand what's going on behind dark energy. Why is it there? How does it behave? OK, so that's one big mystery we have. Another big mystery is it turns out something like 85% of the mass in our universe is invisible. We know it's there because it gravitationally interacts, but it doesn't give off any light. And so we call this mysterious entity dark matter. We're very creative with our names. So dark energy, dark matter. <laughs> And another goal in cosmology is to understand why is it there? How does it behave over time? How much of it is out there? Does it truly only interact gravitationally? Why doesn't it give off any light? All these are big questions. So let's say we want to start exploring some of these things. Well, it all starts with observations. You pick a point in the sky. You are lucky that the sky has a big, giant green square on it that you say, oh, I should probably look there. And you point your telescopes at and start taking real data. So that's pretty, hopefully, self-explanatory. You need to take data to understand what's happening. But now let's say you have that data and you want to understand what best models of dark energy and dark matter describe that data. How would you go about doing that? This is where simulations come in. Effectively, what you do is you simulate the universe from beginning to end with whatever theory you want. And then once you finish the simulation, you extract from it the same things you measure in real life, like where the galaxies are, how fast are they moving apart. And then what you do is you compare the two and it says, oh, this model of dark matter and dark energy is but best fits the data. So hopefully you guys can see why uh, in cosmology, observations and simulations are both important. Observations tells you what the universe is doing. Simulations tells you what you think it's supposed to be doing. And only when you combine them can you see if you understand what's going on. Simulations are also nice in that if you replace a region of the sky with fake data, you can use it for validation of telescopes too. So for example, what if I give a telescope mock data and say, hey, measure the acceleration of the universe. And if the telescope says, oh, I measured it to be something that was different than what you put in the simulation, something's wrong. So in this way, simulations are also really useful validation tools in addition to what constrains our theory to describe best how dark matter and dark energy behave in our universe. OK, so I've talked a lot about why simulations are useful. Let's take a look at one of them, if I can get us to get there. This is a chunk of the universe roughly 400 million, 450 million light years wide for how far light travels in 450 million years. And we rewound the clock to just after the Big Bang. And what we're visualizing here is just the matter distribution of the universe. And as you can see, it's very boring. It's the same everywhere, except very small fluctuations that were seeded by the Big Bang. Now, these are important because as I evolve this density forward in time, you'll see these fluctuations collapse due to gravity. If it goes, there it goes. So here's our simulation running. And as you can see, things start collapsing, and these clumps start forming. We call these clumps dark matter halos. And as you can see, as the universe evolves forward in time, more and more structure formation forms. And so what started off as a nice, smooth, homogeneous distribution becomes a very complicated, what we like to call cosmic web. It looks like a spider web as we like sort of fly through it. 
And keeping in mind, each one of these clumps will host at least one galaxy, but the largest structures like these guys might host thousands of galaxies. Okay, so that's the scale of the type of simulations we're talking about. And then once it's finished, we've now solved the full structure formation of the universe. And a lot of work goes into then turning something like that into turning it into an image that you saw. But at this point, the structural evolution has been done. We've evolved everything from beginning to end. So where do supercomputers come into this? Well, the video I just showed you was 450 million light years wide. But our universe is something like 14 billion years old. So it shouldn't surprise you that if I want to simulate the visible universe, my domain needs to be something like 14 billion light years wide. So what does that look like visually, how big these simulations need to be? Oh, that. So now do you see why we need supercomputers? Spoiler alert, the universe is very big, and so it's computationally difficult to simulate it. And this is why we need supercomputers. And in fact, I'll show you a nicer image here, which is just zooming in so you can see how much detail eventually goes into these simulations. So that's what one of these things look like. And I just want to briefly talk about why Aurora is going to be so impactful. So what do you get with an exascale machine? One quadrillion, which is a number you've never heard before, operations per second. What does it buy you in this space? Well, the volumes we've already covered are about what we need. It's, it's already simulating the, the universe at the scales we want. So what do you gain when you have an exascale machine? Well, effectively, you get a much better simulation. And you can see that in a number of ways. First of all, Aurora has a lot more memory, which means we can simulate a lot more particles. The previous simulation I showed you had roughly one or two trillion uh, matter tracers of the universe. Aurora will allow us to do tens of trillions. Those are all big numbers, but what that means is, is that when I evolve the cosmic web, I'm resolving structures 10 times smaller. And this is important because as telescopes become much better at measuring the universe, we want our predictions to be just as good. And we couldn't get those predictions at the same accuracy in these volumes without a machine like Aurora. Moreover, because Aurora comes with so much extra computational power, it means we can throw in a lot more physics that previously we might have neglected because it was too computationally expensive or maybe we didn't even resolve it. So all in all, what Aurora buys you is a much more sophisticated, realistic simulation of the universe. And it's going to be very important as we go forward moving on. So thank you for being patient with the talk. And I just want to conclude by saying that the next decade in cosmology research is a really exciting time. Scientists currently are building, or have built, new state-of-the-art telescopes that are going to be measuring the universe far better than we've ever done before, way more precisely. I assume you've seen like the web images, for example, that have been going online. And the goal is to combine this beautiful new data with sophisticated simulations produced by the most powerful supercomputers humanity's ever built in order to more deeply explore some of these secrets of the universe, and in particular, hopefully shed some light about what's going on with dark matter and dark energy. I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Nicholas, for the, the compelling talk. Uh, so next, we're going to hear from Nicola Ferrier. Nicola will speak about using imaging and computing to map neurons and brain tissue. They just wanted to confuse you with Nicholas, Nicholas, and Nicola. So I'm Nicola Ferrier. I'm a senior computer scientist here at the, uh, in the math and computer science division. And I'm interested in what we can learn from images. So in science, we have a variety of instruments that produce images, like the advanced photon source that we heard about earlier, and various microscopes, probes, and different types of cameras. And so we use computers to analyze those images that are taken from the instruments and devices. So you know, you're all familiar. Your phone can recognize faces and QR codes. And we can do similar you know, various analysis on the images to understand all sorts of things, such as material properties, biological systems, uh, earth systems, social interactions, human behavior. So you know, we all have a a sen um, we have sensors for things like temperature. You have a thermometer. You have a device that directly tells you uh, the temperature. Well, images are really, really cool because we can use them to study things for which we don't actually have a sensor that will directly measure them. So images plus computer analysis creates sensors for various things, such as clouds and how are clouds moving? Um, what kind of bacteria is this? How are the bacteria interacting? What kind of plants are growing over there? Uh, what kind of bird is up in the sky? What is the atomic structure? 
So for me, working with images also means that I get to work with scientists from all different disciplines, and I get to learn new things all the time as I work on these different projects. So the example I'm going to talk about tonight is work I'm doing with neuroscientists on mapping neurons in the brain. Oh, we're supposed to be on, yeah. So the term we use is connectomics, and this involves trying to find the, the neurons in brain tissue, their shapes, their connections to each other, and this is really the very first step in understanding the, the brain. So connectomics is building this circuit map that helps us understand the message pathways in the brain. So we're also going to need to understand the messages, but that's going to be another talk another day by someone else. So today we're really going to focus on building these circuit maps of the brain. So why would we do this? You know, why is this important? Well, with this mapping in the brain, there's some fundamental questions and practical questions that we can ask. Like, how does the brain achieve its functionality? How does development uh, and disease affect or change the brain? <clears throat> is learning reflected in the structure of the brain and its con connectivity? And you know, also, can we leverage an understanding of biological brains to improve artificial neural networks? So all the AI you hear about in machine learning, the basis of that are artificial neural networks. And so if we can use an understanding of real networks to build better artificial networks, that's kind of intriguing. Can we use <clears throat> biological structure to build faster and more powerful or power efficient computers? Your brain is a really efficient computer. It uses much less energy to do computations than you know, the, the computers that we use in the electronics field. So these are all really great questions, but the first step is to understand the connections and structure in the brain. So let's explore how that's done. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, um, we slice up brains. Uh, so this requires some very careful sample preparation in the neuroscience lab, uh, which I don't have any part of, but I have wonderful colleagues that do that. So they get a sample, they have to stain it, they fix it in the resin, and then they use this very um, th uh, microtome, a very thin knife, to slice up the brain into thin sections, which are mounted on a wafer, and then we image those sections with a microscope. <clears throat> So here the pictures I'm showing you are from an electron microscope, uh, which resides over near the APS. And in the future, when the APS upgrade is complete, we will be able to use x-rays to get um, images of the brain. But for now, everything I'm showing you is an electron microscope. So when you're imaging each slice, it takes the microscope many images to cover the entire area. And then those images are stitched together. Again, if you've used a phone with a panorama option, this, it, it stitches together images. This is a very similar process. So this, you know, once we've stitched that together, that's called a section, um, we have to then take this, the image or this, each section and stack them back together to create uh, three-dimensional volume that is the image of the brain tissue. So next we use machine learning methods to analyze this three-dimensional volume. And within and between the slices, we want to determine which voxels. So on the phone, you talk about how many pixels. In the volume, we talk about how many volume elements or voxels. So we want to decide which voxels are part of the same neuron and trace them through this three-dimensional structure. So then we reconstruct the neuron size, shape, and we also have machine learning methods that detect uh, the connections, the synapses between the neurons. So here in this, uh, these pictures here, we show the segmented target objects. Uh, we use coloring here to help visualize. There's no particular um, meaning to the color. It's just we use color to uh, highlight each individual object in uh, the image and easier to visualize the results. So this is all very interesting. So why do we need a supercomputer like Aurora to do this? Uh, you can do all sorts of cool stuff with your phone and its camera. Well, one is, is that this is a very large problem. So we heard about how big the universe is. Well, uh, brains are really large, too, in a different way. So this is an enormous challenge. So an entire mouse brain contains about 70 million neurons. So this is about an exabyte of data for just the images. 
the process data where we've gone through and analyzed is actually much larger. So usually your laptop storage, you talk about gigabytes or maybe you have a terabyte drive. So a petabyte is a million gigabytes and an exabyte is a thousand petabytes. This is a lot of just the data alone and now we have to compute on that data. So only the fastest supercomputers can even begin to address the challenge of mapping brains. And what's interesting is Aurora has been designed to support machine learning operations, such as the computations that we use to analyze this tissue. So we're really excited to be able to use you know, this new powerful computer to analyze much larger samples of brain tissue than we can currently do. So successful processing of the data will produce a dense mapping of all of the neurons within a tissue sample. And using our machine learning method to find the neurons and the connections, we can then you know, build this, uh, a graph or a mapping, a circuit map of the brain. However, to analyze an entire mouse brain using their current techniques would take over two years of computation on Aurora. But we can learn a lot from analyzing relatively large samples of brain tissue, not whole brains at, at this point in time. And it will be possible now to analyze multiple large samples with the computing speed available to us on Aurora. And we're going to need more than one brain or samples from more than one brain to address the questions I talked about earlier. So to understand change, say from disease, you need to have some you know, non-disease tissue and healthy tissue and some disease tissue to actually be able to tell is there a difference. Uh, so this is going to be a significant computing challenge. So we're going to need their, our supercomputer and we're going to need improved analysis tools and that's what I get to work on so that's really exciting. Um, to, you know, to, to be part of a team that is one day going to understand the structure of the human brain, uh, it's, it's an exciting time. There are so many things that we don't understand about our brains and we're hoping that we're going to bring about that change and learn more through this project. Great. Thank you very much for the compelling talk. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Sarah Weigel uh, to, to speak. Sarah will speak about solar cells and how we can enable the next generation of energy materials. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I hope it's working. So I'm uh, Sarah Vicod. I think we heard like at least three different uh, versions of my last name um, uh, already. But um, I'm assistant uh, physicist uh, at the Advanced Photon Source here at Argonne uh, National Lab. And I'm interested in finding new solutions for climate change and energy storage. And one way uh, we can help in this effort is by developing new, more durable, and more efficient uh, solar cells. So I'd like to start with a little bit of background. Um, so solar power um, is the most abundant energy uh, source on Earth, and it's clean and it's renewable. It is also the fastest growing source of energy in the world, and yet it still accounts for only 3% of the world's uh, annual electricity. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement, and that's what we do here. We can easily also imagine uh, a world in which solar energy helps power, for example, our phones, our computers, our vehicles, even our buildings, and helps us uh, reduce uh, our reliance on fossil fuels, leading to a cleaner, uh, more sustainable uh, environment. So in general, uh, silicon is used as a solar cell material, and it's been on the market for the last like, 30, 40 years, and it has actually a market share um, of more than 90%. And if we go to the next slide, um, what you will see uh, is uh, argon, uh, one of Argon's uh, silicon uh, solar arrays. So it is used here at Argon by scientists to study different panel materials and performances uh, in the Midwest environment. However, the issue is with silicon that it's expensive uh, in terms of manufacturing costs and it has an intrinsic uh, efficiency limit of about 33%. So what we study here at the APS are new materials that can be used uh, in future uh, solar, cell, uh, solar cells. So specifically, we work with perovskites and you see that uh, here in the middle of the, um, uh, on the slide, 
Um, so perovskites are, are, are a thin material that has a lot of potential uh, as a basis for next generation um, of solar cells and solar panels. So where, uh, for example, if you compare it to silicon, so where uh, silicon is very brittle, um, thin perovskites can be flexible because they can be fabricated uh, on, a on a variety of uh, materials. So it's like writing uh, in ink on a piece of paper and can be basically installed wherever we want. Uh, additionally, those uh, halide perovskites in this case exhibit remarkable properties uh, in terms of uh, efficiency and they can be manufactured uh, with half the cost uh, of silicon. However, one of the issues is related to the long-term stability of these uh, new materials. So the goal of the research um, my team and or we work on uh, is to create solar cells that, uh, that can produce more energy for longer and can last longer uh, than what we currently have. For our studies, uh, we use the advanced photon source and in particular uh, the synchrotron to study these material instabilities. Um, so the APS uh, lets us look uh, at materials that are being used in solar cells or can be used even in future uh, solar panels and see down to their atoms uh, in high resolution. So what we're looking for in these new materials is uh, we're looking for any signs of degradation or any change to the composition of the material that might lead to failure uh, when it's used uh, in a solar cell outside. Um, we can also expose uh, these materials to different conditions uh, that solar cells would encounter uh, when they're installed and in use actually outside, such as light uh, and heat, and we observe or we're interested um, how they hold up um, over time. We also use or we use several techniques uh, at the APS uh, to pinpoint uh, these signs of degradation, and one advantage of the APS is uh, that we can access um, a lot of different techniques uh, often on the same beamline. So as part of the upgrade of the APS, we're building more advanced beamlines that can take these studies even to the next level. So it will uh, actually allow us uh, to study our sol solar cell materials in even greater uh, detail due to the increase in flux, as we heard already uh, in, the, in the introduction. So this will allow us uh, to develop new techniques and explore even more materials in the same amount of time it would take today. Um, so we can easily imagine uh, in this scenario where the eventual goal is to, for example, create solar panels that you can roll up and put in the trunk of your car, for example, when you go camping. Uh, panels that just produce more energy for longer and that can basically outlast the current solar energy uh, devices. However, at the same time, this also becomes a challenge. Um, in which we produce large amount of data sets during our experiments, uh, which we need to visualize and also analyze. So to be able to keep up uh, with the speed of data collection after the APS upgrade, uh, we might need the help of a supercomputer to help in some of our experiments. So by using the supercomputer now, we can accelerate the computations um, of complex system and the data, um, as we already heard, also by like more than 100 times or even more. So with the help of the supercomputer, uh, we can plot and analyze our data in real time, uh, which then allows us to, uh, to identify, for example, some features or region of in uh, interest immediately while we're doing uh, our experiment. And of course, we can also think about uh, how we use the su supercomputer in the future, um, for example, to help guide some of our experiments and, helps, uh, uh, and help in data-driven uh, discoveries. So it's really exciting time uh, to work here and to work with the team uh, to, de to develop these next generation uh, solar cells. And I'm really looking forward to use the new APS beamlines and the uh, supercomputer, um, which hopefully uh, can help us discover future generations of energy materials. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah, for the talk. And, and I'd really like to thank our speakers once again for sharing their groundbreaking work with us and how it will be enabled by the transformation of argon with both the upgraded advanced photon source and the Aurora Exascale supercomputer. So if we thank them again, that'd be great. So now I think we have plenty of time for some questions from our audience, both from those of you who are here in person as well as from our online audience. 
If you're here and you have a question, please raise your hand and the microphone, a microphone will come to you. Um, please speak into the microphone so that our remote audience, our online audience can hear you. And if you are online, you can enter your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon and then typing in your name and your question and there should be a submit button there. So let's see if there were questions. I think you were up first down there. If you a question you were speaking about modeling and predictive using the supercomputer to predict events and we were watching a nova program recently about uh, the arctic permafrost melting and they were talking about the climate models that they're only as good as the data that's put in them and one of the things that was omitted from this model was that permafrost would melt and that would be increasing the CO2. And they, a good portion of the program was about the model is only as good as the data that's inputted into it. Would a supercomputer like this pick up that possibly that was never inputted because they believed the permafrost would never melt to the extent it is? Would it yeah. know that maybe it would it tell you you would need to add additional ideas that you weren't considering to the model? Yeah, thank you. That is a good question, and that is a very tough question to answer. I'll, I'll take um, on. So do you want to take it? Yeah, Please. so um, it won't be able to tell you that the permafrost is or isn't melting, but usually with a model, there's a sense of accuracy. Uh, of, um, so, you, you know, Nicholas talked about looking at what we see now and comparing it to the model. And we, we can do that with uh, Earth system models or the, the climate models. But it, it, without the data, your model may be inaccurate. And usually, there's some sort of internal metrics that you, you measure things within your model to know whether or not it's accurate. So we'll probably be saying, this isn't accurate. It might not know, you know, might not know why that you know, it hasn't modeled this one particular aspect, but it would pick up a, an, an error or a, an inaccuracy, and then the people running the models would have to f figure out what, what's missing at this point. Although once we get some really good AI going, um, it, it, there may be ways to predict where the error is coming from. Well, once we get really good AI, we won't even be. Yeah, we won't be here <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Let me, let me, I, I just, uh, let me okay. jump in and add a little bit of information in that the Earth Systems models are being continually updated, right. uh, really with new information as we observe it. Uh, the Department of Energy funds what we call the uh, ARM program, which is the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Programs with observational stations around the world, if you will, and that data is, is fed into uh, in the next generation of the Earth Systems models, so they're continually updated. So. Please know uh, it may not be uh, present in the model that they featured in the NOVA uh, program, but it is something that we continue to work. And it's really how we improve, uh, really, the accuracy of the models as we take observational data to help drive uh, further improvements in the modeling. So I thought I'd add a little bit. But that's a great thank, thank question. Thank you, Paul. And, and that's actually kind of the whole point of the transformation of Argon of what we're talking about is to be able to really do what you just said and couple the, the observational data and experimental data with the computing resources that allow us to analyze it in real time. And then I know people jokingly say about AI that we won't need humans anymore, but humans will still be very critical and important and in that loop, right, where we can use our creativity and our scientific knowledge to, to make these kinds of decisions and think about, well, why, wasn't, why didn't we include permafrost in it? But yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Yes, You've got a hand. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think you were waiting. Hi, um, I have a question about the uh, simulation of the universe. Um, I'm wondering, what is the smallest unit of what you are simulating? Is it a star or ah. a galaxy or a group of galaxies? Great question. And then, and then, and then also, okay. how, sorry, two questions. I was excited because I can answer that one. And so I, I, I can't, like, yeah, I can't yeah, wait yeah, to yeah, hear it. Like, and yeah, yeah. and then, uh, what, what, what's the distance of interaction that you model? Is it the maximum possible distance? with the speed of light, or is this something more local that you, that you simulate? Thanks. Both, both are great questions. And so um, you got the volume. So that was 14 billion light years. So that's how far light travels in 14 billion years. And you asked the smallest scales. So typically, each one of those particles is roughly something. It depends on how good the simulation is. But let's say it's something like 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8, which is 100 million stars. 
100 million stars per particle, right? And this shouldn't surprise you because the universe is huge, right? So if I want to fill a whole universe in a supercomputer, I can't model the atom, I can't model the solar system, but that, that's the skills we're talking about. And um, I do, I do want to add, which goes to part of the first question, uh, this stuff is only as good as the data that comes in, right? So a lot of the data that comes in, the whole goal is when the, the, the best we can tell how well our simulations represent the real life is completely driven by how well real life tells us it is itself, right? So if I tell you that we're doing a really good job resolving the universe, it's not because I'm saying that, it's because when we compare it to real life, the data shows that it's there. So that's why this data-driven, as everybody's saying, is a very important element to what this is. But I hope I answered your question um, to what you, what you had asked, right? Cool. I think we have an online, a couple of questions online. We yes, we have an online question. Um, it's about mapping the human brain and the applications for that. So how will mapping the human brain uh, look at how people recover from brain injuries or unlock the mysteries of dementia? So the goal is to be able to do that. It will be a long time before we can do whole human brains. And But um, so the question of... Uh, recover from injury, as I said in the, my talk, like, you know, you have to have multiple, you've got to have a lot of data to be able to compare normal versus diseased. And so it, it really depends on the size of the region we're looking at. But none of this, you know, I don't want to give the impression that there, there, there really are not clinical applications for some time. This is really research and trying to just build this understanding. And so, um, you know, being able to understand dementia, again, if we could do multiple samples and get samples at different ages or different stages of dementia, that would cast some light into the issue. But uh, at this point, you know, as I said, we, we take samples from a brain. And so one of the projects I'm working on now is actually using leftover tissue from, from surgeries. So it really is tissue from live patients. But to be able to understand certain things, you know, everything we do with most of our samples, they're, they, they're, they're fixed mice, so they're no longer living. And so, you know, that's a hard thing to analyze a person over time, but we'll be able to collectively get enough data about brains in general um, when we can do this on multiple samples. Hi. Uh, will this uh, Aurora system be able to go out to the outside world and use information like AI, like ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI from Microsoft? Will it connect out there and use information from that to solve its problems, or is it a completely closed system? Well, I will just say that there are many mechanisms that we, the DOE makes these machines available. So for example, the Insight program, any group from anywhere can apply to use these machines. Right? So this isn't something that we built it just for ourselves. It's very much an open community project. And on top of that, uh, with respect to, you mentioned Chad, GPT and all these other things. Uh, it was mentioned before, but these machines are very, very good, as you, as you heard in the, in the uh, brain talk, of, of doing AI tasks. And one of the big goals in, this, in building Aurora was to be able to do these very well. And so doing a lot of the applications, like you said, is indeed one of the major goals, and indeed is a collaborative effort with um, people from all over the place. Hi. My question is about um, the universe and the size, and you talk about light years. And the things that you said are just like beyond my comprehension, obviously. It's like talking about infinity. Um, but my question is, like, how does time impact the data that you're collecting because some of that stuff might be gone now. It's all gone now. And so, <laughs> no, no, that's, that's how it works. And in fact, I just realized I didn't even answer your full question. You asked, what was the scales of what we've resolved? And the answer is, is that you resolve the gravity in the entire domain. It's a long range force. It's the, the whole domain you have to resolve the gravity in. And to answer your question, of, uh, indeed, when we measure something in real life, what you're seeing is the light that that thing gave off when it gave it off. So that means that if I'm looking at, for example, when they say, I'm not sure if you've heard the words when people look at the cosmic microwave background, and they say that that happened 300,000 years after the Big Bang. That means that photon that hits your eye was given off 13 billion years ago. And in fact, the things that are, if I say something is a million light years away, one, light, one million light years away, that means it was given off a million years ago. 
And so the universe is one of these freaky places where you look back in time, and whenever you say you look deep into the universe, you're actually looking back in time. And that's what it was then. And, it, and the objects you could be seeing aren't there anymore, or it could be moved or changed. And so it's a quite an interesting problem when you look at it that way. When you simulate it, you are the observer. So you're simulating the universe. So when I say at this time, this is what the universe structure formation is, and you saw the simulation completed, that's what the structure is everywhere at that time. But if I were to ask, what does it look like to the person who's looking at the sky, it doesn't look like that, because the light that's coming in has traveled. And this is actually, if you recall, I had a transition where I said, look at this image, and a lot of post-processing work changes the simulation into an actual image. That's because we have to account for all that. And that's where it becomes challenging. But hopefully that answered what you were asking. <laughs> yes. Another online question. Yes, another online question. Uh, we're giving several questions about AI and how you're using it in your different domains. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I've talked a lot. You guys should go first. And then... Do you want to talk about AI? No? Okay. So when, I, when we do the analysis of the images, when we're looking for the neurons, there's a neural network, um, a, a machine learning operation that actually does that process for us. And so Machine learning works by, you take, or well, at least this is supervised learning, one form of machine learning, you take a bunch of data uh, that has been labeled. So uh, many years ago, some people painstakingly went, th go through those images and you know, labeled that this is a neuron and, and traced it through. And that gave us training data to train a neural network to do that task for us. So we use machine learning to do that analysis of the images because people doing it by hand is an incredibly painful <laughs> operation and, and it's very tedious and slow. So by using that expertise, then we train a network and then the machine learning task does it for us. So we use machine learning for you know, all of the operations that we do uh, in, the, in the, the brain mapping. Um, and it's used in you know, many other things that are going on in the lab. Oh, yeah. so, um, you know, it's, uh, Aurora's designed to be able to, uh, you know, optimize a bunch of the machine learning tasks because whether you're studying pharmaceuticals or all the work that went on here, how many people in the room know how much work went on here about COVID? It was in the papers, but yeah, there was a huge amount of research here on trying to understand um, the, the structure of the, the virus. And, you know, again, a lot, of that, a lot of those operations are machine learning. There's a huge project here uh, studying cancer. Again, it's, uh, you know, trying to use a bunch of data and machine learning. So it's really important for many of the computational tasks, and, you know, people are working on it uh, in every domain that you can because, for one, machine learning actually a lot of times helps do things a lot faster or more efficiently than... Um, than you know, humans doing them. Yeah. And I'll just add that in cosmology, AI is a really useful big deal. So for example, in observations, you, you talked about exabytes of data. Our new observations are going, to be, are going to be imaging billions of galaxies. So we have tremendous amount of data that comes in. I didn't even talk about that. I talked about the simulations of it. And so previously, people used to have grad students literally look at images coming from telescope and being like, oh, that's a galaxy. That's a white dwarf. But now when you're measuring billions of them, we don't have enough graduate students. So we use machine learning algorithms, for example, to feature find, which is what their original easily, that's something easily mappable to it. In the simulation space, what we didn't talk about that much is, is that if we change our models, we don't have infinite computational time. So I can't run a billion different models. So what if I only want to run 30 of them, and I want to guess of what different models in between would have given me? This is called emulation, and this is also commonly used for AI. And so AI in general already has a big impact in cosmology. And I just want to say at Argon, because these machines, like I said, are very good at doing a lot of these machine learning tasks, it's not really only our privilege to use it, it's our obligation to. It's our obligation to you to use these machines as best as we can. And so we're constantly trying to come up with what are better applications of machine learning things that we can put in our fields because we have that at our disposal. And hopefully that gives you a little bit of it. Okay, I think we have Oh man, it's getting even better. One's getting excited. So uh, I have two part question. Uh, first, you can almost argue like, you know, because Aurora is faster and better, you can run any project faster and better. 
in addition to these three great projects, right? So my question is, what are the guidelines when you select project which can work on Aurora? Are there guidelines in place, or are you, you know, there is a process in place? That's a number one. Number two, uh, when are you planning to make it available for public? so that anybody like university or anybody doing research can use this? Well, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, it's just, it's just that, I mean, so first of all, the readiness, what, the one word that maybe you didn't say, but what you mean in our space is readiness. What's your computational readiness to be able to use the machine, right? And so I mentioned the Insight program. The, the, there's a whole, very much like universities, delegated system where you, you give it to different scientists where when people pitch to use the machine, you judge whether or not they can. Uh, obvious one is the machine has, in this case, 10,000 nodes, each with, with six GPUs, so 60,000 GPUs. So we're talking about a really high, large number of, of nodes. And so very often the qualifications are like, can you scale? Can you efficiently use the machine? For sure you're using the GPUs. We don't want people just using the CPUs because they could go to university for that. So there's a whole lot of, of things like that. And that, that, sort of, that sort of goes into the whole thing. And then if, if I recall, what was the second question again? It was, I'm not sure if you saw it. When is it ready for the public? Oh, when it's ready. So that was. Are, yeah, there, we, there's already, the, the Insight proposals already went in. And yeah. in ju June, people are already pitching to use it. Yeah, so the, the Insights are for uh, January 1st next year is what you're asking for. And so yeah, it's already going. Exciting time. Uh, I have a question from our online audience uh, for Sarah. If, could you talk more about what the future of solar looks like and how it will help with decarbonization? Yeah, I think uh, um, also, like I mentioned in my uh, talk, like it's really like to cut down on, you know, uh, the fossil fuels that we're currently using. So I think uh, solar has a lot of potential. Um, and I, I mean, that's just like one example I presented here, but there are uh, way more materials we can explore that, you know, might even result in even, even higher um, efficiencies. And that's also like coming back to one of the questions for the, uh, you know, how we use AI or machine learning. Um, it's like one way, uh, like material scientists usually use uh, the supercomputer, for example, um, when we look for new materials. So usually we need to make like, thousands of different compositions or materials that we then test. So in terms for some of the, uh, the solar materials, we just um, select maybe like, uh, you know, a couple hundred, and then we uh, feed uh, those properties uh, into, or use the data, uh, then and use the supercomputer, kind of help us predict what could be a new material composition, and, you know, with like, um, tailored uh, properties in terms, uh, so that we can use it in, a, um, in our solar cell, um, devices, basically. Someone's been waiting patiently right here. <laughs> uh, actually, that was related to the question I was going to ask. <laughs> you mentioned uh, we only use a very small percentage of the solar energy. And yes. with the climate change and the right. concerns and keeping the temperature increase below the two degrees and much less, um, is it possible that the new system will help us reach that goal? And is it just the availability of the solar materials, maybe using the thinking process and yeah. helping our you know, universe, uh, our population to respect the energy yeah. crisis situation? What are your thoughts? No, I think certainly, and it's like if we think about, you know, the earth, it's basically, I think 90% of the land and like the countries fall within, you know, the solar spectrum. So technically we could use solar power and solar energy like everywhere on earth. So, you know, it's still possible. Um, but of course, there are like certain uh, you know uh, challenges that we need to address, uh, and like one is certainly uh, related to efficiency. Because I mean, you don't want to have a solar cell, you know, you want to that it holds up for like the 20 years, and you don't want to uh, you know install every five years uh, new panels on your roof. Um, so there are certainly some challenges we need to address, but I think there's still uh, a huge potential. Hi, um, it's a question for both the cosmologist and the person uh, 
map in the human brain. How do you see the techniques of simulation impacting the work of modeling the brain? So the work I'm doing right now is purely data analysis. However, there is a bunch of simulation work. Uh, I, I said that we'll wait for another talk to talk about the messages, and there's a lot of work in that space that's in simulation. Um, but the, the work of the mapping is really under, you know, it really is just data and, you know, collecting data and analyzing it. But then if you really want to understand the brain and how it operates, I'm building a map, so I've got, you've got the map of the interstate, and if you want to understand you know, the distribution of goods, you, you need some other pieces besides just the map. And so after you've got the map, then you can start looking at you know, what's being transmitted along. And a lot of that work right now that's going on, which also uses the supercomputers here, is in, in simulation space, where people simulate signals. And was the question, how does cosmology help map the brain? Oh, techniques, techniques that we're doing help map the brain. Um, probably not at all. Probably not. No. Uh, yeah. So I, I, no, I, would, I, would, I would just say that in general, what, what a more general question is that machine learning and these types of algorithms, and they're, they're not, these aren't a bunch of different specialities. So for example, if you were to look at a bunch of proposals of all the very different things that we run in the supercomputers, they're very similar because in high performance computing, there's just not many things you can do. You can solve PD equations, which just means you're solving some sort of system. You can solve machine learning equations, learning equations, mapping equations, inference equations. Typically, most of the time, it's optimizations questions. And all of these things, all of the fields are doing so in that respect, Everybody's helping everybody, and, you, and uh, you, everybody's trying to apply the similar techniques as they go forward. Now, obviously, there's some domain-specific things that happen where once you're mapping to the brain or you're mapping to the universe, you have to curate what you're doing to map it properly to the, to the, to the computer you're running on. But the techniques are very similar in that respect, albeit not one-to-one. -one. OK? Um, yeah, you, you talk about computing at scale. <clears throat> Would there ever be a use case uh, for uh, to apply in the rare disease medical space, where there's a low volume of data, but um, researchers need to uh, understand it better, and you know the time to research that is very prolonged because there's so few cases. Uh, for example, like GM1, which is a lysosomal storage disorder, only affects like one to two hundred thousand kids globally. You know, would there be a use case uh, for something like that? So you're, the question was about um, studying things that where there is very small amounts of data. So um, I don't know that anything that I'm looking at would, would be helpful, but I think some of the techniques that people use really are trying to find uh, what I'll call anomalies, or, uh, and I don't know if those techniques would be useful in, in rare cases. So often the things we, you know, we, if you're looking at machine learning, you usually need a lot of data. And so if you're talking about something that doesn't have a lot of data, it's probably not a machine learning task. Um, but there are, you know, if you look at the, the whole collection of uh, biological data about a, a various subject, there may be ways to pick out uh, anomalies that may actually point to sort of rare or unusual cases. And, and to further your point, um, your question, uh, bioinformatics is one of the biggest fields in this space. So this is, this, these technologies are used quite often. For example, drug companies use it. You can look at a bunch of different patients, their reactions to drugs, and then you can repurpose drugs saying, wait a minute, this drug that was used for heart disease might be used for something else. Or you might have drugs that do different things that all of a sudden you, you reapply. So uh, information from the health sector is, and, and diagnostic medicine is getting huge gains in this area. And indeed, one of their challenges is sparsity is another word for what you said. The data sets themselves. If you're only talking about hundreds of cases, how can you connect them. And, in, and this is something that because the machine learning data set of everyone is so large, the hope is you actually can extract these features. And you can make improvements of this stuff. And we hopefully can help these people who have these rare cases and, and apply the things that they go forward. And so this is a very big active field in, in, um, in computer science. 
I think we have time for one more question uh, from the gentleman right over there. I'm, <clears throat> I'm wanting to uh, give a compliment to Argonne for the outstanding work they did in terms of the COVID research and the many, many dedicated people that were involved in that. And I only know just a smattering of that. But my, my uh, curiosity is with uh, the complexity that was involved in that, and then if you look at the upgrading that's going on, within the supercomputing and the APS, how would that have played out and what ramifications would that have had had that been in place for COVID? Craig Musk. Do you want to try? Or? <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously if we'd had the APS upgrade in place and the supercomputer in place, a lot of things would have been done a lot faster. Um, it, you know, but, uh, I think the, the work was tremendous and it was tremendous, it was as fast as could be given the resources we had at the time. And so there is some hope that, you know, if, you know, knock on wood, please don't happen. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but, you know, in the future we might be able to much more quickly and rapidly do some of the analysis with a, with a bigger computer. I mean, obviously bigger means more computation, so, um, but, you know, I, I think the work was phenomenally fast given, you know, it, let's say the supercomputer we had at the time was tied up with COVID and all of the rest of our research took a, a back seat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I, I think that's about right. It's, 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 a, a, it's one of these things where you can't always predict what's important and hindsight is something that you don't really have the luxury of. But the good news is, is that as things happen and as we learn from them, we now are prepared to make a lot more advances as we need to and something that potentially we didn't appreciate before. And as she said, at the time when people finally got it up and running, all of the machines were dedicated to that at the time. And, uh, and other research that potentially wasn't so life-saving was pushed back. And, uh, and that's important, and it's important for us to prioritize these things. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate your participation tonight, and we do apologize if we haven't been able to get to all of your questions. Um, if you do have questions, you can certainly email out loud at anl.gov, and we'll try to get back to you. Um, if, I think we'll stick around for a little bit, so if, if you do have a pressing question, we'd be happy to try to talk to you about it. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers again, our laboratory director, Dr. Paul Kearns, for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you at the next Argon Out Loud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.